Good morning, everyone. I believe we're live on uh, the internet. And we're just getting started with the Bible study. Again, Pastor Matt is out. And uh, Mike is uh, recovering from some uh, medical procedures as well. So I'm going to try to hold down the fort here. But i got to be the first to admit, uh, I, uh, I have not kept up with all the technological changes here. I'm hoping you're seeing this screen. Michael's telling me he's seeing it, so I'm assuming everybody else is as well. We're going to begin in verse 26, Acts 13, and I've got the New Living, Tr uh, New Living Translation up. First, Lord... We ask for your blessing on this situation, uh, that uh, you bless our study together, that we, uh, we get from this word that what you want us to have, and that we incorporate it into our lives, that we live lives that uh, the lives you want to see us live. Uh, and we ask this in Yeshua's name. So again, Acts 13, 26, NLT. And this is a bit of a back tr uh, tread on what we covered yesterday, but I want, I want to cover it again because it's, this is getting into uh, Paul's method of evangelism. Uh, when he uh, approaches a new town, he goes to the synagogue first, and uh, we saw that entry yesterday. Uh, we saw what he presented first, which was a, a history of... Uh, Israel as it per, as he th felt it pertained to his audience and so we got a particular perspective and he um, uh, is concluded what he's doing is he, he laid out that history I, th I believe it's to show his brotherhood with his audience that they they're all Jews this is what they have in common this is their common uh, history and as such he's coming before them as one of them so to speak um, so in verse 26, he starts with the word brothers, okay? And um, this is where he, uh, okay, this is uh, where he's really getting into his evangelistic message. So verse 26, brothers, you sons of Abraham and also you God-fearing Gentiles, this is the message of salvation that has been sent to us. Okay, right here, this is... Uh, Michael signaling by hand. Spread it out. <laughs> I'm not quite sure what you're saying. Okay, he's uh, working on something. So this is the message of salvation that has been sent to us. The people... You know, he's showing me a copy of the Bible. I don't know if you're saying this. Right here. We're right here. This is the verse we're working on. Verse 26. Oops. Okay. Um, the people in Jerusalem and their leaders did not recognize Jesus as one of the prophets had, uh, that uh, the prophets had spoken about. Instead, they condemned him, and in doing this, they fulfilled the prophet's words that are read in every Sabbath. This is pointing out the uh, uh, the irony to this situation, that the, the, uh, the, the, the uh, resistance that Jesus uh, experienced in Jerusalem that ultimately led to his crucifixion was the fulfillment of prophecy. Uh, it was there it, it, so, it, so that it is not misunderstood to be a defeat of him. His, his uh, crucifixion was not a defeat. It was a triumph, ultimately, especially proven by the resurrection. But it was also a triumph in that it is a fulfillment of prophecy, the actual crucifixion. Uh, so, uh, to continue, continue on here, uh, prophets had spoken about. Instead, they condemned him, and in doing this, they fulfilled the prophets' words that are read every Sabbath, verse 28. They found no legal reason to execute him, but they asked Pilate to have him killed anyway. This is all prophesied. When they 
had done all of the prophecies that you said about him, they took him down from the cross and placed him in a tomb. Okay, and here we are, two steps toward the salvation message. First of all, Jesus died, died for our sins. That will be, become more apparent as we go on, go on. But also that he was buried. Okay, died and buried. But, verse 30, God raised him from the dead. Exclamation point. Of course, because this is the, this is the triumph of the grave, and uh, this is our blessed hope right here. God raised him from the dead, and we are told that we can, we can be blessed as well. Verse 31, Acts 13, 31, NLT. And over a period of many days... He, Jesus, appeared to those who had gone with him from Galilee to Jerusalem. They are now his witnesses to the people of Israel. Okay? And he's a member of that body, of course. And uh, now we're spreading to the uttermost parts of the world. Where this is being said in Pamphylia, which is modern-day Turkey. Uh, this is how the gospel has spread. This is, again, Paul's first missionary journey. And he's now in uh, mid-Turkey, mid-modern-day Turkey. Verse 32. And now we are here to bring you this good news. Makes it all very plain and simple. The promise was made to our ancestors, and God has now fulfilled it for us. This is it. We're living in the midst of this fantastic prophecy. This is what he's saying. Uh, for us and for their descendants... By raising Jesus. This is what the second psalm says about Jesus. You are my son. This is uh, God the Father speaking. You are my son. Today I have become your father. This is the father declaring the sonship of Jesus. Just so that we're absolutely clear. Jesus is part of the Godhead with the Holy Spirit and the Father. Okay, Verse 34. For God had promised to raise him from the dead, not leaving him to rot in the grave. He said, I will give you the sacred blessings I promised to David. David, it sounded like the promise was made through David, but David was speaking of Jesus when he, uh, when he spoke on this matter. Verse 35, another psalm explains it more fully. You will not allow your Holy One to rot in the grave. There it is. This is... You know, the Holy One of God, the grave could not hold him because he's a sinless man. Sin brings death. If you're sinless, you don't die. If you don't die, you don't rot. So this is what's being said here. Verse 36. This is not a reference to David, for after David had done the will of God in his own generation, he died and was buried with his ancestors. And his body decayed. And the tomb of David is in Jerusalem. Um, it can be visited even today. Verse 37. No, it was a reference to someone else. When David was speaking of this, David was speaking of someone else. Someone whom God raised and whose body did not decay. This is the uh, destiny uh, that uh, the Messiah fulfilled. And... Verse 38, brothers, listen, we are here to proclaim that through this man, Jesus, there is forgiveness for your sins. This is the whole gospel message to everyone. Through faith in Jesus, there is forgiveness of sin. Verse 39, everyone who believes in him is made right in God's sight. Something the law of Moses could never do. You see that emphasis there, that, that addition there. He's making clear to Jewish people that the law of Moses could never make anyone right. It was the death of Jesus fulfilling the Old Testament, the, 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 the Levitical uh, uh, statement that um, the wages of sin are death. Death uh, can only be... Uh, accounted for and paid for by another death, by the letting of blood. Without the shedding of blood, 
there is no forgiveness of sins. That's the way it's, I'm paraphrasing from Leviticus, but that's the way it's written. And that's the, that's the very crux of uh, Jesus' ministry. He came to fulfill that aspect of the Levitical law, which changes everything. If the sin debt is paid, then we have, we have righteousness restored. This is the message of salvation. This is the message of the gospel. So what Moses couldn't do through the, Levit through the Mosaic law, Jesus was able to do uh, by, uh, by paying the sin debt for everyone with his, with his life. Okay. Now there's a warning of caution here. Verse 40. Be careful. Don't let the prophet's words apply to you, for they said, okay, that's the prophecy talking about mockers. Look, you mockers. In other words, unbelievers. Don't be disbelieving about this. Instead, I mean, be amazed and die if you're going to remain a mocker. You have negated the faith, and without faith it's impossible to please God. Without faith it's impossible to have your, uh, the blessing of your sins eradicated. Uh, instead, for sin comes death. And there it is. Be amazed and die. For I am doing something in your own day. Something you wouldn't believe even if someone told you about it. So some people, even if they're witness to, believe this is what he's saying here. There are other interpretations, but what he's saying, the way, I, the way it reaches me, it says, is to say that um, even if somebody spells out the message of salvation for you, you're not going to believe it. Uh, and that's, that's a shame. That's a tragedy. That's a tragedy. Okay, so verse 42. As Paul and Barnabas left the synagogue that day, the people begged them to speak about these things next week. Isn't that a great testimony? They begged him, <laughs> begged Paul and Barnabas to speak about these things next week. We want to hear it again. The, same thing. the message of salvation is that great, and we're taking it in the way, it all fits, way you make it fit together, Paul. Uh, yeah, this sounds like this is it, the fulfillment of prophecy coming to pass in our day. How wonderful is that? But again, because it is, I mean, this was a hope they lived for for many centuries, many centuries before this came to pass. So, uh, you know, uh, and in every generation, uh, we think, is this the fulfillment of such and such a prophecy? Um, and they, they're, being, they're being shown by Paul and Barnabas that, yeah, this... These pieces of the puzzle fit together. This is prophecy fulfilled, folks, even for us in our day. How great is that? Okay. So many Jews and devout converts to Judaism followed Paul and Barnabas, and the two men urged them to continue to rely on the grace of God. Okay. So again, interesting, great way to finish. It's all by God's grace. This is the emphasis here. It's all by the grace of God that this is happening. God gave his son that whosoever should believe in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. How are we doing time-wise? Yeah, it looks like we could continue. Now Paul turns to the Gentiles. Now again, he's, um, we are, let's say, right here. This is what he uh, recently traveled from Cyprus, where he witnessed to the um, proconsul there. Uh, the, interesting, the um, uh, Sergius, the proconsul, was apparently the first Gentile convert uh, outside of the um, the area of the uh, of the immediate. Um, uh, <laughs> uh, mission that uh, was laid out from Jerusalem. Here we are on the Isle of Cy uh, Cyprus. Paul laid out the uh, mission, the uh, the uh, message of the gospel to uh, the proconsul. He got saved, and um, this was on. So Paul's first missionary journey, first convert, first Gentile convert outside of. Uh, the immediate Holy Land, so to speak. 
And uh, they moved on to Perga and up to Pamphilus, Pamphylia, say Pam, Pamphylia up here, Antioch Pamphylia. Um, the, uh, this, is what, this is where he just preached the message that we were talking about. Uh, we're going to see the next step in the journey is Iconium. And to pick up with that, let's go to verse 44. So Paul turns to the Gentiles. And again, this is where, uh, yeah, Paul, Paul's missionary commission was to the Gentiles, as you may recall. Um, but his method has always been to go to the Jew first, to go to the synagogues in the, in the places that uh, they uh, were uh, uh, witnessed in, and then to include the Gentiles. Now, there's more and more emphasis of the message going to the Gentiles, because they're getting further and further from the, from the Holy Land, so to speak. So verse 44. The following week, almost the entire city turned out to hear them preach the word of the Lord. As you can imagine, message of salvation. Uh, please, if it's a repeat, great. Just <laughs> let's hear it again. <laughs> verse 45. But when some of the Jews saw the crowds, now this is where the, uh, the uh, unconverted Jews uh, step in and provide the resistance that they continually do. When some of the Jews saw the crowds, they were jealous. Notice their motivation. They realized that they're being usurped in their own backyard. That uh, There are some newcomers here in town, and when it comes to spiritual things, they're putting out things that supersede anything we have. So they're jealous, the motivation. Okay, so they slandered Paul. They didn't have anything to top his message with, so they slandered him. This is often the case. You find this, <laughs> this is also a very common political strategy. If you can't top the guy, slander him. And argued against whatever Paul said. Verse 46. Then Paul, Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly and declared... It was necessary that we first preach the word of God to you Jews. But since you have rejected it and judged yourselves unworthy of eternal life, we will offer it to the Gentiles. You see the pattern here. The message went forth. It was a mixed crowd in the end, Jew and Gentile. But the Jews rejected it. Okay? And in, in effect, by doing that, by rejecting the message of salvation, they judged themselves. They brought judgment upon themselves, making them unworthy of eternal life. And this was referenced in the last psalm reading, too, that you don't want to do this. If you hear the message of salvation, be open-hearted about it and really listen well, because this is important. <laughs> this is everything, really, to accept the, the word of salvation, the gift of salvation. Okay? And so, Paul says, we will offer it, the gospel, the message of salvation, to the Gentiles. For the Lord gave us this command when he said, I have made you a light to the Gentiles, to bring salvation to the farthest corners of the earth. Okay? And when the Gentiles heard this, they were very glad and thanked the Lord for his message. And all who were chosen for eternal life became believers. Okay, uh, isn't it interesting how religion gets to be the stumbling block and the resistance, the point of resistance to the actual message of the Lord, the actual will of God, which is for salvation. This is, this is just one of the tragedies of, of, um, of uh, clinging too tightly to a religion that does not expound on salvation faith it's by faith the just live you're justified by faith and that it opens the door to salvation very important not a matter of keeping the law of Moses but rather faith in the salvation wrought by Jesus on the cross for our sake verse 49 so the Lord's message spread throughout that region Okay, so this is, again, now this is primarily Gentile region. And we're in the midi middle of, um, of Turkey at this point. Um, verse 50. 
Then the Jews stirred up the influential religious women and the leaders of the city, and they incited a mob against Paul and Barnabas and ran them out of town. So they shook the dust from their feet and as a sign of rejection and went to the town of Iconium. Okay, so here's their, tra their, uh, their trek in red and from uh, Pamphylia and on to Iconium. Okay, right in here. Uh, so, oops, here we go. Iconium. And the believers were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. Oh, how wonderful is that? But this is a, this is a great lesson in uh, Paul's methodology, his uh, MO, modus operandi, the way he went about conducting things. We see the, uh, the approach first to uh, the presentation first to the Jews in the synagogues, and then um, the bringing in of Gentiles, and then finally more concentrating the message primarily on the Gentiles. Uh, and uh, the, the way he went about it again was to structure a portion of history that everybody could relate, that all the Jews could relate to, and that by which he could make himself um, brethren with them, saying, this is my common uh, ancestry, my common heritage as well, as we share. So I'm one of you when I tell you this message. This was the great door opener for Paul. And of course, he talks about the fulfillment of prophecy. It's that fulfillment of prophecy that is uh, truly a um, uh, the bellwether, really, for spreading the Christian faith. That, uh, you can read, you can go back into the Old Testament and read these prophecies that were made and see that it is Jesus uh, who fulfilled them. And uh, the more you study, the more you realize he's the only one who could have, and with the, the changes that have occurred since, he's the only one who, I mean, that's it. It pretty much seals uh, the message of prophecy fulfilled. He's, Jesus fulfilled uh, so many scriptures. But there are still, you, you, know, you got to realize on his first coming, he fulfilled 300 prophecies. Actually, a few more than that. Over 300 prophecies. Statistically, that is just off the charts, literally. This is way beyond statistical certainty for one, for one man to fulfill that many of events. But keep in mind, there are 2,800, 2,800 prophecies pertaining to his second coming, written in the same books from which we read the prophecies fulfilled. So uh, there's a great body of evidence here, uh, prophetic fulfillment, that underlies uh, our faith, our, and, and this can't be underestimated. It's huge. So very much worth studying. And Father, we want to thank you for this time that we've had to work on your word, to, to get all the beautiful treasures that you've incorporated here for us, uh, that we might have all the more substance, all the more reality that you've provided through prophecy fulfilled that uh, we can incorporate into our lives to strengthen us in our faith that we might better live the lives that please you best. That's our goal and we pray for your leadership that we will continue to, to do so. We thank you in Yeshua's name and We'll say that's it for today. Hopefully you can join us tomorrow. Hopefully we'll have more technical issues ironed out, and uh, we'll go from there. Bye-bye.